Welcome back, everybody, to episode eight of the Strictly NFL podcast. Back again with Jeff, joined by Schwinn. Obviously, we had to uh, have the Bills fan on here. So we're going to be recapping, you know, everything that went on. Looking forward to uh, week seven, coming off of a big vic- victory for the Jets. They are going to unfortunately be in a bye week. So the Strickland does have a Patreon. There is a $3 tier, a $6 tier, and a $9 tier. This podcast can be found behind the $9 tier uh, if you like what you're hearing. In addition to the Strickland having a YouTube, which is the Strickland, on Instagram at the Strick.land. Um, uh, the $6 Strickland Patreon can get you access to the Strick and Roll, which is uh, Schwinn's uh, personal uh, podcast every other week. In addition to a lot more stuff like a mailbag, uh, Strickland Discord, and all that other good stuff. Uh, secondly, this podcast is sponsored by Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your sports betting needs, where and it's where you can get the latest odds, lines, and match reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and many more sports. It continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place online wagers, including live betting, and where you can play your favorite casino and card games right from your phone. So you can head over to their website or, you, like I said, use your phone to sign up today and get in on all the action. Use the promo code BELIEVE, which is capital B-L-E-A-V, for 50% off on your welcome bonus first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Um, but let's hop straight into it. Let's start off with the Giants game, guys. How do we feel about the Giants game? Shwin, I'll let you take the handle on this one. Um, I mean, I probably felt differently about this game than maybe anybody. Um, because as a Bills fan, I hated this game with a passion. Uh, it's probably one of the most annoying games I've had to care about for the entirety of it. Um, I would put it up there against the wild card game last year against the Dolphins, which was another extremely annoying game. Um, yeah. but I will say this there's a couple things that I think need to be said. Obviously, the Bills did not take care of business, uh, in this game, they they definitely played with their food and. Whatever analogy you want to throw out there, they did that. Um, I think the Giants' defense has actually been trending in the right direction the last few weeks, and that's not to like make it seem like you know, oh, what a great performance by the Bills' offense to just like put up two touchdowns in this game or something. But I, I think this is like, if you're a good defense, you'll have games like this at some point where you just have somebody's number. I also think there were some extenuating circumstances. Um, Brian Dable, obviously very familiar with the Bills and Josh Allen. Wink Martindale has faced Josh Allen many times in his career already. I think three times as a coordinator. This would be three times before this season. This is the fourth. Um, They obviously have intel from guys that they brought over from Buffalo, right? Hodgins, whoever. I don't think that can really be downplayed. I I do think that's significant. Even Boogie Basham, I totally forgot he was on the Giants until I was like rewatching the highlights and I was like, oh, that's right. He's on the Giants now. Um, So I do think that played part of it. The London element of it all, I think, is also another part of it. If you watch Josh Allen's post game, like he looked like he had just ran. I mean, and granted, he had just played a fucking football game, Um, but like he looked like he had not slept in two weeks or something. Uh, I do think that's another piece. And the final thing is like, I just think we played poorly. Like we just had a bad game and it was two weeks in a row and that that's part of it. But I one, one thing that I have, I think I, I asked you about this in the discord and I do think this was part of it. The bills clearly anticipated wink doing wink stuff, which means blitzing 7,000 times in, you know, a game. And he didn't do that at all. I think he's blitzed something like three times the entire game or something. It was, and even the blitzes they sent, they were not, I don't remember zero, like a, a single cover zero blitz. They were all like delayed. Maybe you send mm-hmm. an extra rusher. It was not some nuts, you know, crazy stuff that he was doing. And clearly the, jo- the bills were not expecting that. And it took them an entire half to like get their shit together and figure out what they wanted to do which is a problem for the Bills. If they want to win a Super Bowl, you have to adjust faster than that. But I also think the second half for them was really good. Like they scored, they had three, the ball three times. They scored two touchdowns. They, one of them was like, what, a 90 yard drive. And they basically just ran the ball down the fucking giant's throat. The second Um, one was 90 yards, right? 
I, well, I don't remember whichever one it was. It was either the first, I mean, each yeah. the first or the second one. I think it was the first one because the second one was off a kickoff, right? So they would have yeah. done the ball like at the 25. Mm-hmm. But like, and then the third drive, that should have ended the game. Like Josh Allen makes a little bit better throw or Dawson Knox just catches the ball, which I think he should do anyways. And that game is over. Like it's, it's over and yeah, it'll still be annoying, but we would, I'd be sitting here feeling like, well, that was annoying, but we took care of business and you know, we got to, we got into victory formation. How wonderful. And instead you have to sit through this like agonizing last minute and 15 seconds where I was like, I have watched this game 7 billion times because I've watched Tyrod Taylor play quarterback so many fucking times when he was the Bills quarterback. And this was like the most Tyrod game where it's like, he will not beat you. Okay. He will not beat himself. He will make these throws out of the pocket where you're like, how are you just putting it in a bucket for this guy on the move? Like, are you the greatest quarterback ever? And then you get into like (laughs) inside the 20 and then it's just like, I don't know. Like, can he really, like, he's not dynamic in there as a thrower and it's, and it, and there's just not a lot of like touchdown juice that he gives you really for lack of a better term. So the, like the play extension is, is like the most valuable thing with him. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And I like, mean, we saw that. Yeah. Yeah. And he was like, and so like, you know, and obviously it comes down to whatever you want to sit here and talk about. Like, I know there'll be giants fans that are like, Oh, pass interference, pass interference. I'm like, sure. If you want to tell me that they should have called pass interference on on Waller on the final play, like, or I guess twice in a row, right? So he gets the one that takes you to the one, and then the one on the final play. You, if you want to tell me that, that's fine. But I also think this idea that like the Giants got this absolute garbage whistle in this game is kind of ridiculous. They got away with two pretty obvious DPIs at the start of the game that like I don't think I was shocked that at least one of them wasn't called. They also on that final drive, Saquon Barkley. That, that clock should have been running. He goes out of bounds backwards. Like that, that I agree with. That, the clock should be running there. So to me, you can't and and if you really want to get technical with it, which I'm not trying to, but like the snap where they spiked it, the fucking center, like he false starts. He moves the ball like it's a false start. That that's a runoff the game's over. Oh, you're you're talking about um when he picks it up from the set yeah. point and extends it out, right? I, yeah. I, I see I, that. I, again, like I, I understand, like, look, if they call that too, like I'm not I would I would feel like well, that's kind of bullshit. But if you want to play the technicality game of like, did the refs have a bad game? Like, and I've talked to Jeff about this before. I've I've said this to anybody. I think every team on aggregate in the NFL pretty much gets screwed and gets the benefit over a long, like a full season, about 50-50, except, except the one caveat is, except for the Kansas City Chiefs, who get every call all the time. And I truly believe that. Like, I think every other team basically benefits and gets screwed roughly the same amount. So, like, there are things I could point to and be like, well, that was a bad call. And there are things that Giants fans could point to and be like, that was a bad call. And ultimately, I think that shit cancels out. The the Giants played as good a game as they could have. I think, obviously, the mishap at the end of the first half is ridiculous, especially for a veteran quarterback to, to not understand that. That probably, I mean, in a lot of ways, that basically was the game. And I also just want to say, and I'm going to turn it over to you guys. I thought this was like, if you, if the Giants wanted to go into teardown mode and just sell vets for whatever they can get, Bobby Okereke might be worth like 17 first round picks after this game. Cause that was one of the best linebacking performances I've seen all season from anybody. Like you could put that up against, Roquan Smith, Fred Warner. Like, I'm mean, obviously, I'm not saying he's the same level as Fred Warner, but in the, on this day, on this day, yeah. he played as good as any linebacker in the NFL. That was an incredible performance by him. Yeah, um, I, I, that was, that is like the best game I've seen from a Giants defender since Dexter Lawrence, probably like since I really got serious about watching football, like since the Michael Strahan days, mm. like he. Got after the pass here a little bit. You know, he was playing spy on Josh Allen on a lot of passing downs. When he wasn't playing spy, he was getting into passing lanes, two tip balls, one uh, one for an interception, one forced fumble, numerous tackles for loss. I mean, like, that guy did not check did, – did, did not leave a box unchecked in that game. It was one of the best performances I've seen from a linebacker. I think he took, and like, three passes in the game, by the way. Something like, like that. I know, I know off the top of my head, I know there was at least two. 
um, because the other one was um, the, the the Jeff the play that we highlighted on Twitter, right? That that RPO where he pulled it from uh, I believe it was James Cook and he tried to hit it to Diggs. Oh yeah, that was an incredible play. That play was yeah. ridiculous. And um, and then the uh, the interception where on both of these plays, right? I, the Diggs play a little bit less so than this interception play. Um, on the Diggs play, just would have been a, a pretty big gain. But on the interception, if Allen can get that ball past Okereke into Dawson Knox, that might be a house call. So now you're talking about not only preventing six, but you're also talking about getting the ball back for your squad. Like he had, he had one of the biggest, like, um, win percentage increases, in, increasing performances I've ever seen from a, from so, a linebacker. So like, I usually despise Chris Collinsworth because I just think he's like so over the top about everything. Mm-hmm. But so that tip you're talking about the one on the on the RPO where he like they showed it from the end zone angle so like yeah. right behind it and you know Collinsworth doing his whole he's doing his whole thing he's like let me tell you like this Mike this, <laughs> this, this pass year and you see it and I'm like all right I'm sure it's like but it's like a dime like it is a dime he's about to hit digs in stride in a window that like I, I think there may be two three quarterbacks max that can make that throw that can even like. Mm-hmm. It dream about throwing it into that window in the in the league, and it's you're seeing the replay, and it looks like it's going to be this just beautiful, beautiful pass, and Okereke just gets his fucking big ass arms out there and knocks it down, and it's like he played honestly the game of his life, and I swear every time he plays the Bills, he plays the game of his life because I remember this guy when he was the Colts, and he was like every I hear his name like fifteen thousand times, like Okereke. I'm like, who is this guy? Where did he come from? Uh, but he was he was phenomenal. I mean, I, I can't really say enough about how good he was because I I don't want to say like he defended us by himself, but like for example, I remember, I saw this clip today of like uh, like and I think Deontay Banks is a good player and I think he had a pretty decent game against Stefan Diggs, who's you know what like top three difficult cover in the league. Um, but like they're like oh Deontay Banks locked him up and I'm like man all I'm seeing here is Diggs basically getting open by a step and. All of a sudden, Bobby Okereke's hand is like blocking a pass, and he's in co- he's helping double up, right? He's providing back bracket coverage, and it was just such a one. I think it was such a different game plan from Wink than anybody would have expected. Um, there was not nearly as much just man to like you know kamikaze man to man as we have seen from Wink normally. Like last week when he had that play with Tyreek, where I'm like, "What the hell are you doing?" Um, but I mean. I, the game plan was good, but I also just think Okereke in so many ways played so far above the scheme that he was in a lot of ways, what kept the giants in the game. Because if you really look at it, like, yeah, the giants kind of forced Josh out of the pocket a bit, but I don't think the pass rush really got home that much. Um, I, I don't think it was, that... it was really only Dex uh, Dex yeah. and a little bit of cave on. Yeah. And, and like, I don't really think, I didn't watch that game coming away being like, man, Xavier McKinney, like he was all over it or Deontay Banks or whoever uh, was phenomenal. I did think Cordell Flott, is that his name? He was actually pretty good in that game. Um, He looks like a nice little player for you guys, but I just can't, I really can't stand up. I just thought Okereke was like unbelievable. And this, the bill slack I'm in, like after the game, we were all just like, dude, what? Like, did that guy eat his Wheaties or what, man? Like that was something crazy. If, if they'd won the game, he should have won. You know, I, and maybe he still should. He probably still should win Defensive Player of the Week or whatever, whenever they get that award out. Because they, the only reason they lost is one stupid self inflicted error at the end of the first half, and two, like Josh Allen pulling out a touchdown throw out of his ass. That I, I will say, that I don't think any other quarterback in the league can make that throw that he made. That was a ridiculous throw. I don't even understand. Like to, to like know that you're have the physical talent to make that throw when he made that in the direction he's moving. I don't even understand how that thought process, because I thought it was ridiculous. Like it was, it was not like, that was an incredible play. So I, I, I think the Giants defense was great. And I think Okereke very specifically was the reason they were great in this game. I don't even know if that throw was meant for Quentin Morris because Morris kind of comes over the top, right by the goal line. Diggs is underneath him yeah, coming across that, by like a three yard line. So that throw was such a hard throw to attempt that I initially thought it was four digs and he just missed digs and it landed in Morris's hands. But then I was like, am I just trying to be a hater right now? Like, I don't he, know. That's, that's, that's so ridiculous. The window was like the size of my head. Yeah. I mean, that throw was crazy. He Quentin Morris also is just a guy like 
I don't know if the Bills going to be able to keep him after this year, but I think some teams should be looking at him because I think there are teams that he's got great hands. He's made some phenomenal catches in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Um, He just doesn't get targets because Ken Dorsey is a moron. Um, But like, it is what it is. I mean, and and also I will just say this because I, I think this needs to be said. I watched like a pretty in-depth film breakdown of the all 22 of that game of like every passing play that we ran the ups, like it's good to have a number one receiver and it's good to like make them the focus of your offense. But if you can't leverage that into creating easier opportunities for other guys and targets for other guys, that's a problem. And that is a problem that like is part and parcel of, you know, you get caught off guard with your game plan a little bit because you think Wink's, Wink's going to do something and he doesn't. But those are things that need to change. And um, even though Dalton Kincaid does not set the world on fire in terms of his individual production, I think you saw how much the Bills missed being able to play out of 12 personnel in that game. Um, he opens up so much for us in the passing game, and I don't think it's a coincidence that when he was out, like we looked just so ineffective until the second half when we made – when we did this crazy thing of like playing James Cook more uh, and playing like Khalil Shakir more, which was really cool because Khalil Shakir probably should get more snaps. But yeah, James Cook, really good game. Um, but yeah, I, I look, I, I thought also, I'm sorry, I'm just going to shut up now. But last thing I want to say, <laughs> I think giant skill receiver guys, I think they're, they really need a boundary. But you saw a lot from, I thought, Hyatt and Wandale Robinson in this game where you can kind of like, if you're like, okay, if we got, if we plugged in AJ Brown as our wide receiver one, now think about what these guys are providing. And I think you can kind of see like, okay, these guys aren't bad. They're just not the dudes that are going to like raise our floor. Maybe they help you raise your ceiling, right? Cause once you get the one, you have a higher floor and now you need guys to push the ceiling. But yeah, um, I thought w- Wanda was really good. Like that guy's a tough cover. Good luck to to slot corners around the league that are going to be trying to stick with that guy for a while. Yeah, I think Wandell for me is the biggest takeaway because <clears throat> this guy had the torn ACL during the game where he hit 100 yards for the first time, right? The first time where he really got, you know, a true kind of Wandell, you know, take us home. We're going to we're going to lean on you this game kind of workload. Fourth week off of the torn ACL, he comes back. I believe he caught all eight targets this week. Again, obviously for eight catches and 62 yards. And I think five of those eight catches were first down conversions. So I know the discussion is going to be, well, you know, Joe passed on a Pickens, Joe passed on this guy, and this guy can be a boundary type of player. And you're not rolling in that kind of, you know, disappointment in the pick. But don't confuse disappointment in the pick with disappointment in the player, right? So um, if you guys are following us on Twitter, I posted – Cole Beasley's stat line from the his three really best years in Buffalo. And it was always 80 to 90 catches. I believe it was like 750 to 950 yards, somewhere around there. Uh, maybe you guys can double check me on that. It's off the top of my head. But it's it's very easy for me to see this type of pathway for Wandell Robinson. You know, like I think definitely over a course of a 17 game season, 90 catches should be attainable. I think 900 yards should be attainable. And the touchdowns for me, he's not really going to be a high touchdown guy, but, you know, this offense with him instead of Paris Campbell, you immediately see the difference. So uh, Wandell is a guy I think this fan base gets way too much crap to. Um, and, I, and I like Hyatt making some tough catches. He made a couple tough catches throughout the season. I think the hands were a real underrated part of his draft profile that even I didn't look at, you know, well enough. I just want to add, because we haven't said his name, um, I thought Micah McFadden played a good game on defense, yeah. too. And I thought that he was probably the Giants' second-best defender. Um, he was everywhere. I think he had the second-highest PFF grade. Um, it wasn't a surprise to me. That I know the Bills ended up scoring on the drive, but the Giants got a really big goal line stop, and it was Bobby O'Karake and Micah McFadden in the backfield uh, slamming Latavius Murray to the ground. Um yeah, I mean, you guys covered pretty much everything from the game. It was pretty great. We we haven't really talked much. I mean, Schwinn mentioned how it was a kind of a prototypical Tyrod Taylor game, which is true. Um, but we haven't really talked about who he was replacing much. You know, we 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 obviously are not gonna. There's nothing much to say about Daniel Jones regarding this game. 
but there was a lot of chatter about him on social media and just like, Oh, what would have happened if Jones played? And I just want to say, I feel like the people who, um, well, we, all Giants fans should be supporting Daniel Jones. So maybe this is the wrong way of saying it, but the people who just sort of like blindly support him and they're like, Oh, look, see the offense. They didn't score any touchdowns. It looks exactly the same. The offense looking the same with a 34 year old backup isn't a good thing. That's 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 not good. Like if you don't some miss would anything, say, some would say it's a bad thing, Jeff. Right. And that's not even true. But even if that were true, that's like a pretty bad sign for Daniel Jones. But the thing is, is that it actually didn't look the same. They gained more yards than the Bills did in that game. Uh, you, there's no other game where you can point to where you're like, ah, you know, the Giants had some negative touchdown luck, and that's the reason they didn't score touchdowns. No, the offense has just looked shitty through uh, through five games, and then it looked kind of shitty against the Bills. And by the way, that matters too. The Bills are the best defense that they've played besides probably maybe the Cowboys. I don't know what you guys think of Bills Cowboys, but those well, are the I will. They, the Bills at full strength would definitely be better than the Cowboys defense, not even close. But they're not at full strength. But it's still a really good defense. Really right. Good. So being like, oh, oh yeah, the, the the Giants offense against the Seahawks at home looked exactly the same as the Giants offense at Buffalo. You know, it's just it's a ridiculous argument. But then you get into actually breaking the film down. And what you see is Tyron Taylor is actually moving through his progressions much quicker than Daniel Jones. Last season, Daniel Jones looked good, really good, uh, whatever. Whatever you want to say, Daniel Jones looked. And Pretty Brian cool. Dable built an offense that was clever and basically relied heavily on the first read. It made, it made Daniel Jones' life very simple. It made it created a lot of easy throws for Daniel Jones. And he has a good arm. He has good arm talent. That's what everybody sees. People like his combination of arm talent and his ability to move. That's why people are kind of – not kind of, people are about him. I get it. I'm not saying he's, like, dead to be a good quarterback. But the next step for him, once opponents figured that out, once they were like, oh, he's going to his first read a lot, was to take that away and make him go through the progressions. And what we've seen through five weeks is it takes him a long time to go beat for beat for beat as he's going to the second read, the third read. And that makes – that makes things look worse than they actually are. Am I saying the offensive line no, is good? No. But I had people being like, oh, well, it's not Daniel Jones' fault because he didn't have Justin Pugh. Justin Pugh off the couch. That's the difference. Off the couch. That's, that's the reason that Daniel Jones hasn't been able to look good is because he didn't have a great left tackle like Justin Pugh. Like, and Pugh played a good game. But he was elevated by a quarterback who knew – like who's like, okay, my offensive line is poor. I know what to do. I have to be quicker going through the reads. I have to get the ball out faster. I have to understand where the pressure is coming from and adjust accordingly. That was a veteran performance from a veteran quarterback. Jones isn't playing with great receivers. He doesn't have a great offensive line, arguably one of the worst offensive line. Is he maximizing it? No. And we saw that last night. Jones can do more, and it all starts with how he processes reads and how he, when he gets to the line – how he downloads where the pressure is coming from and adjusts where he steps up in the pocket when he gets the ball out. And to anyone out there that's just saying, Oh yeah, they just, they looked exactly the same. No, they they didn't look the same at all. (laughs) Yeah. I think this probably isn't the kind of like the go-to example for the theory I'm about to say, but at some point I questioned the ability for Daniel Jones to set pre-snap protections and pass plays like his rookie season. Eli Manning came in for that Dolphins game, I believe. And uh, I forgot if there was one more game or not, but I vividly remember the O-line being one, much more operable two, the O-line getting beat at points and Eli still being able to take those deep shots. Then the end of the uh, final Joe judge season was kind of neither here nor there. It was, was whatever. But then to see the O line function in a way that it that it did uh, the other night, you know, maybe this isn't a DJ thing, but Evan Neal was much better, in my opinion, especially the tier of pass rusher that he was going up against. You know, Rousseau, Von Miller, all those guys. Um, the left side, I know it was Pew who hasn't been there with Daniel Jones, but you're telling me that left guard playing left tackle off of a torn ACL with no training camp, nothing is better than Josh Azudu, like 
that stuff is, is weird for me to kind of compare apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. But it's concerning, you know, as, as somebody who was a Daniel Jones fan preseason, you know, it's not something that you can just ignore and be like, oh, well, you know, they improved. They improved over a, what, a, a six, seven game, I mean, a six, seven day span from week five to week six. I mean, what, what are we talking about? That, that's kind of, that, that's just being blind to a problem, in my opinion. That's that's all it is. Yeah, I, I mean, it it is what it is. I mean, they, Evan Neal did play better. But his quarterback helped him play better. That's the quarterback's job is to make his offensive yeah. line look better. And it goes both ways. The offensive line has to – the offensive line can make the quarterback look good too. Um, but my point is is there's meat on the bone here for Daniel Jones. And it's – he's an intelligent guy. Like it's it's there for him. But I'm just speaking to the people who are just vaguely looking at the stats and the yards per play and, <laughs> and just being like, oh, okay, yeah, we didn't score a touchdown, so it's basically the same. And yeah, it just, it wasn't the same. And even if it was the same, not exactly a glowing defense of a guy you just gave, you know, four one sixty two or whatever. How often do we talk about sack prevention to some extent being the quarterback set for Justin Fields, right? And Daniel Jones doesn't get that standard applied to him. I think that that's kind of bullshit, honestly, you know, like, especially because I gave him credit for that last season. I thought he did great sensing pressure and kind of feeling out the rush. Honestly, it's been abysmal this year for him in that aspect. So you see also uh, we've we consolidated the receiver position a whole lot this week. It was mainly Hyde, Slayton, and uh, and Wandale with some Hodgins reps in the red zone and uh, in, in like third and three situations type stuff. But, you know, no more Paris Campbell, one rep of Sterling Shepard, which didn't come on a passing play. So essentially now you have your three best players and you have your complementary piece. Waller is really not missing snaps post week one. Um, and if Daniel Jones comes back and Andrew Thomas and JMS are there healthy, there is absolutely no excuse for him to not be putting up real legitimate statistics, right? Like weeks two through five, it's not that they don't count. By no means do they not count. But you're not giving them the same credential, right, as a line with JMS, Bredesen back at left guard from center potentially Pew at right guard next to Neil um, and just Thomas back at left guard. Right. So that for me is the ultimate test because if he comes back with those pieces around him, consolidated wide receiver core, a healthy wall or all that stuff, you're getting cut, man. Like I don't think people in the public definitely obviously see this because there's not really all the Daniel Jones fans out there, but he's not seeing the other $80 million of that contract. Like no shot, even even right now. I, I, if you had to, you know, put me to the what's it called to the brickstone, whatever. He's not seeing that eighty million dollars. He's I'm pretty sure he's getting cut. So, I think this could like if there is some upside to this, right? Um, I think it can help sometimes to sit and see somebody else run the offense, see how it's supposed to look and see the reads they're making. And I'm not saying it's going to happen. You know, we don't know. If Daniel Jones isn't like some first-year player, right? He's played plenty of NFL football. He's got a lot of starts under his belt. The level of decision-making and processing that we saw from him this year was alarming, to be honest. Um, but everything we saw Tyrod Taylor do, literally all of that, is not super difficult stuff. It's understanding... Okay, where am I? Like, who who is who is the play designed for? Where am I supposed to go with this? Boom, quick decision. Okay, read a coverage pre-snap, read a post-snap, <coughs> make a quick decision. Like understanding that stuff, obviously easier said than done. It's this is not this was not like Tyrod Taylor doing like Patrick Mahomes stuff, right? And and as an example, you can just look at the crosstown team. Zach Wilson, for the better part of two seasons, looked like a total mess. Looked like a mess, right? Looked like a mess his rookie year. Looked like a mess last year. And he looked like a mess for the first however many games he played this year. I think it was like three games, right? And sure, some of it came down to, I think, that um, Hackett has adjusted a bit. I still don't think Hackett's doing anything particularly amazing. I think he's just doing like some very baseline level stuff that simplified the offense. And... All of a sudden, Zach Wilson is just doing the simple thing, right? And it's like, oh, throw it to 17. 
check it down to 30. Don't commit stupid, gigantic errors trying to make crazy plays out of the pocket. Like, it's all very, very basic, simple stuff, and that makes a huge difference. Obviously, if you're paying Daniel Jones $40 million, you want a little bit more than that. But you've got to start somewhere. And if nothing else, you need him to play at that basic level so that you can start seeing what these guys have. Like, you actually found some shit out about Jalen Hyatt in that game, right? You found some shit out about Wandale Robinson in that game. And that's really important. And, like, the, for the people – I know there – I saw a lot of Giants fans being like, well, Saquon played, and so he had, like – I'm like, okay, well, Saquon played against the Cowboys. What the fuck was that? What happened there? Like, that was a total shit show. And even and let's not pretend that the first half against the Cardinals didn't happen. That did happen. Jones was awful in that half. And yeah, he played an amazing second half, maybe the best half of his career. And Barkley was healthy for most of that. But like, so you have like six quarters of the season where he played with Barkley and he was god awful. So I don't think it's just about not having Barkley. Like, I think he was just not running the offense the way it's supposed to be run. He's not making quick decisions, not making the right reads. Can he get better at that? Sure. Is that ever going to, is that going to be enough? Is he going to reach the level of performance that you want from a guy you're paying $40 million effectively signaling he's your franchise quarterback? I don't think so. But if nothing else, if he can just play at an acceptable level for the next couple of years to the point where he's getting the ball to the guys that you need to get the ball to, at least you're going to find out stuff about them, right? I mean, this was like, obviously, I'm not saying Jalen Hyatt or Wondell Robinson this level of player, but like, when you had, you know, Andy Dalton for like a decade, it was just what was his easy button, right? I'm just gonna throw it to Jamar. AJ or, Green. Yeah, AJ, AJ Green. Green. Yeah. Oh, AJ Green. Okay. Oh, AJ Green. Oh, this play is for the tight end. I don't care. AJ Green. Like it, sometimes it's not. It doesn't need to be hard. Like you don't need to be, you know, Aaron Rodgers. You can just be Andy Dalton. It's fine. You can. You're allowed to just be Andy Dalton if you, especially if like that's what you are. Andy and Dalton's still getting checks. Yeah, he's still getting checks. And and he's he went he went to the playoffs multiple times. You know what I mean? Like he's he's been there. So like I I I really feel like last year he was taking the easy button, and this year I don't know what was going on with him, but it was just such a mess. And it's like he he just wouldn't make a read. He wouldn't pull the trigger on anything. So maybe you know if I'm the Giants, I'd probably tell him to sit another week. Be like, just make sure you're good to go. I think having a week, two weeks to just really like just see get get that view of like what another guy is doing who's not as talented as you and see how things are should operate and and shit maybe just seeing sitting on the sidelines he'll look at these guys and be like oh i can't trust wandell robinson oh i can't trust jalen hyatt i mean that fourth down catch that jalen hyatt made in the in the fourth quarter on that was that that was the last drive right that's a big time catch he got hey. absolutely leveled on that play and he he, he come, coming across the middle so you know you're gonna take a hit there right yeah. and he got crushed i think that was poyer might have been that leveled him out there and he held on to that thing and or it was bernard and he held on to that and like i mean that's a that's a play that i think if you're a quarterback you're like okay i can trust this yeah. dude hell yeah so he he's like these are the things that it's important for him to see and hopefully whenever he gets back he starts capitalizing on this stuff